We are now recording. Judge Kennedy, you may proceed with the program today. Thanks, Lionel. Um, good morning and welcome. Well, it's morning here in, in New Mexico. Uh, welcome to the ABA uh, Science and Technology Section Fall Webinar Series, Video and Legal Decision Making. Um, the ABA Science and Technology Section and its uh, Evidence Law Committee is really honored to have Dr. Sandra Rostovska, uh, who is an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder in Media Studies and a, a documentary filmmaker and a student of how to use uh, video evidence and visual evidence in court um, as a resident uh, as a resident fellow uh, in our section. Um, today's Today's episode, I guess, is law through the camera lens, interpreting video as evidence in court. And as we all know, video is, is coming into court more and more often, it has. Um, but uh, despite the common maxim that seeing is believing, uh, not everybody sees a video uh, in the same way. It might be that we become eyewitnesses uh, with all that carries with it. Uh, because we're imprisoned by the camera and its very own point of view as, uh, as a single way of looking at things the same way our eyes would be. It also might be that our, our inclusion in a 24-hour availability of true images, um, news and otherwise, has caused us to be less uh, questioning or critical of what we see when it's handed to us through a camera lens. Um, and anyway, in this opening session in the fall's webinar on video evidence, uh, we're going to be discussing how visual attention, perception, and interpretation work in court. And uh, this is going to include the latest research in law, science, and humanities, um, all of which come to play with, uh, uh, with video's admissibility as evidence in court, and, uh, and how people tend to, uh, to weight and sometimes overweight the evidence that we see. Uh, considering how a video is presented and used in court is critical for the pursuit of equal and fair justice um, and certainly is an element of, uh, of a judge's gatekeeping role uh, at trial. And uh, that is what we are going to be covering. And uh, we are going to try to make video evidence more relevant to lawyers in this video age and uh, visual age that we have. And now I'll turn things over to, uh, I think, Rory. Hi, yes, um, my name is Rory Bledsoe. I am pursuing a PhD in media studies and I also have a law degree. Um, and I am going to be moderating this panel. Uh, Judge Kennedy all kind of um, already introduced uh, Sandra Rostovska, who is a professor of media studies at CU. Um, and she does interdisciplinary research focusing on the role of images as evidence across law and policy domains. Uh, nationally and internationally. And then I'd also like to introduce uh, Yael Grineau, who is an assistant professor of psychology at Smith College. Her research focus is psychology and law. And one of her main lines of work explores how people watch and make decisions about video evidence. Uh, she uses eye tracking and other experimental techniques to understand how people can come to different conclusions about the same evidence. Thank you so much to Judge Kennedy and Rory and Yael. I think we can uh, share our PowerPoint at this point. And I also like to uh, thank uh, SciTech and um, uh, Lionel, Barbara, Laura, in addition to Judge Kennedy for all of their help and support in putting this series together. So we're talking about the uh, interpretation of video as evidence in court. And as a warm up, We'd like to start with an image that may be familiar to many of you. So you're about to see an image on the screen and please write down the first thing that you see in the chat. Many of you may have seen this image many times, but we ask you to still play along. Now, can we see the image? Here we go. So please write in the chat, what is the first thing you're seeing? Okay, somebody says a rabbit, somebody else? Duck, rabbit. Okay, response is coming up. Yep, some of you are seeing a duck, some of you are seeing a rabbit, and maybe some of you are seeing both. 
Now, if we believe we see a duck, then we keep seeing a duck here. And if we believe we see a rabbit, we keep seeing the rabbit. Now, some of us may be more used to seeing ducks or rabbits and this familiarity may lead us to recognize that particular animal in the drawing. But the reason why we use this as a conversation starter is because Gestalt images are really a nice warm up to questions about perception and interpretation. And they really get us to ask the question of how do images work? Now, photography critic Vicky Goldberg wrote a while back that the viewer is outside the frame of the photograph, but inside the frame of its meaning. So what does this mean? Images like photographs, like videos, do not speak for themselves really, but they can be interpreted. And interpretation, as Vicky Goldberg said, is a notoriously tricky game. As viewers, we bring in our experiences, our ideas about the world, and our blind spots to bear on images. Now, this is why visual communication scholars say that images- you know, be, be careful because- Oops, okay. Uh, this is, uh, a, a, some, a, somebody has the audio on, but that is perfectly fine. So this is why, you know, when we think about how images work and we think about why interpretation is a notoriously tricky game, visual communication scholars talk about how images work through two forces. One is denotation, the other is connotation. So let's go through both of them. Denotation refers to what images show quite literally. Connotation, on the other hand, suggests that images provide more than what is caught by the camera. In other words, connotation draws from the broad symbolic system in lending meaning to what the camera shows. Now think of our Zoom screen right now. You're probably seeing me and a few other presenters in like a small window to the right. And then you're seeing this black screen denotation, connotation, and potentially the recording button and everything else. Now, if I were to ask you what you're seeing, it's likely that at least some of you, if not most of you, you say that what you're seeing here is a Zoom presentation. But actually to say that we're on Zoom and this is a PowerPoint, we're drawing on our familiarity with the software and the medium. We've been used to this, we know what it is and we automatically go there. In the process, we're ascribing meaning beyond what we can say if we were to uh, describe our scenes quite literally. So if we were to just stick with what we are seeing. And we mentioned denotation and connotation because these two factors shape visual interpretation even in court. So in our promotional event for this series back in July, Judge Kennedy and I mentioned a very famous Supreme Court case, Codd versus Harris from 2007 that many of you may be already familiar with. But just briefly, you'll see a screenshot from a dashboard camera footage that was used in court where the court had to decide whether a police car chase, which left the driver paralyzed, violated constitutional protection against unreasonable seizure. Now, lower courts ruled that reasonable jurors could differ as to whether the police had used unreasonable force to end the chase. But the Supreme Court ruled eight to one in favor of the officer, explaining that the case was clear from the videotape. Now, we mentioned this case because when we look at the video, on a denotative level, we can tell that there is a car chase, but to know whether the driver was reckless, perhaps we can check whether he passed any red lights and perhaps we can count them and do things like that, but there's very, we're limited in what we can say just with the video. At the Supreme Court though, one of the justices compared the car chase in the dashboard footage to the movie, The French Connection, uh, that the famous you know, chase and screenshot is included here. So in other words, the justices turned to a connotative level of meaning, which may or may not have been appropriate for the case at hand. So one point that we wanna emphasize in our presentation today, this is one real important point, is that seeing is not only about what the eyes physically see, but the experiences and ideas that a viewer brings to an image. And one way to think through this idea about seeing is to understand how visual communication scholars think about vision and visuality. 
Now, when we talk about vision, it's important to note that people trust vision more than any other senses. In a survey of 1,400 people from 16 different countries, respondents were asked which of their five senses they would least like to lose. Now, regardless of age or gender, 70% indicated that vision was the sense that they would least be able to do without. Vision is also prioritized in the anatomy and function of the brain. 50% of the cerebral cortex is dedicated to processing visual information, and there are 1 million fibers in the optic nerve compared to the 30,000 fibers in the auditory nerve. As a result, our brains process images faster than words. Faster processing also means that visual attention is limited and therefore selective. Now, visuality is particularly interested in the ways in which what is seen and how it is seen can be culturally constructed. For example, how race, gender, identification with power and authority, along with other factors, shape the many ways in which people interpret images. Even popular culture references can influence seeing, and this was evident in Scott versus Harris. So we gave you a few categories to think about visual meaning making already. Denotation, connotation, vision, visuality. We'll give you one last categorization because different fields have different ways of labeling the influences on visual perception and interpretation, but we promise that there is a purpose behind this exercise. So this last classification comes from social science that seeks to distinguish between factors that are internal to the viewer and factors that are internal to the image. Again, this was something that we covered in the July session, so just a brief overview here. Endogenous biases refer to what the viewer brings to the image when they are interpreting what they see. Endogenous biases refer to what the viewer brings up. Uh, so one example, I'm sorry is when researchers run a very famous experiment that showed that the interpretation of the Scott versus Harris videotape differed based on cultural world, world views and ideological backgrounds. The bottom line is that not everyone who sees a video interprets it in the same way. We're bringing in who we are, our belief system, our cultural backgrounds to bear on the images. Now, exogenous biases refer to features of the image itself or the viewing context. For example, researchers have shown that videos played in slow motion compared to normal speed, resulting greater judgment of intentionality in the depicted action. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Yael Granod, who will summarize these influences on visual perception and interpretation in a very useful rubric that gives us an idea of the problem in a nutshell, at least the way we see it. Thank you so much, Sandra, and thank you everyone uh, who's listening. And, and I hope uh, we're definitely trying to make some, some time for questions at the end. So please uh, don't, don't hold back uh, and we're gonna have a, a little bit of time for discussion. Uh, but like Sandra set up, we, we sort of hit you at the beginning with these binary distinctions between connotation and denotation, vision and visuality, endogenous and exogenous uh, influences. And part of the reason those, uh, those distinctions are important is because they can help us localize the source of systematic bias in the way that people appraise video evidence and precisely try to figure out how such biases can impact legal judgments. And so what we've tried to do for you today is organize a handful of examples of some of these systemic biases that come from factors inside the perceiver and factors inside the image uh, or the evidence itself. Uh, and in particular, in our overview of examples, we want to highlight three main issues uh, that we think help, help us consider how these biases might affect judgments. So in particular, we know that when people see video evidence, they struggle with how to distinguish between relevant and irrelevant information. And so part of the processes that then may occur is that people might underweight uh, the information that they don't see and overweight the information that they do see. Uh, furthermore, people end up being overconfident about their interpretations of what they see. They lack an awareness that they have essentially their own potential for bias in interpreting video evidence. Basically, like Sandra was saying, they're getting this seemingly direct firsthand experience they feel like they're getting from the evidence, and that makes it particularly difficult to question it. So what we'd like to do today is share with you some notable examples of these three processes uh, from the research that's been done so far on these issues. And so I want to start with this idea of overweighting, uh, that people might overweight the information that they see. 
And basically that gets at the sense that when people watch video evidence, what it captures becomes particularly salient and perceivers then seem to ascribe greater, greater causal agency to what is salient, essentially, to the, the targets in the scene that they are seeing. They ascribe greater causal force. And that's, I think, best exemplified by something social psychologists call the camera perspective bias. Uh, and this is work that finds that the angle of the camera, particularly, for example, in the context of police interrogations, can influence greatly how perceivers evaluate the subsequent confession that results from the interrogation. So, for example, I might show you this image from a videotape of an interrogation that's aimed where the camera is aimed at the suspect. And you might see this guy who is twitchy and nervous and sweating. And so you you folks who see this framing of, of the interrogation scene are more likely to think uh, that this, this guy is likely guilty and that the confession that he utters is true and sincere, as compared to people who see what researchers call an equal focus perspective that includes the police officer in the scene. This angle instead, where you have the context, you have the opportunity, for example, to see, see the police officer, and he, he has the potential to become salient as well, Therefore, you can also ascribe causal force uh, to the, the officer in the scene. And this angle leads to significantly like reduced perceptions of culpability uh, and sincerity of confession relative to the first angle that I showed you. So basically, in this case, the angle of the camera directs our attention and leads us to ascribe more agency and sometimes overweight or blame uh, the target that we see more. Um, this process of overweighting is actually so powerful that we may in, in turn uh, ascribe veracity, agency, truth to something that we might even objectively know is not the truth or did not occur. And in one particular fun sort of set of studies that I know is, is removed from the legal context, uh, what researchers did is they brought participants into the lab and they gave them a sort of a decision making task where they had to answer multiple choice questions, but they had to bet monopoly money on the likelihood that they would answer those questions right. And every time they got a question right, they were allowed or invited to take monopoly money from the bank into their own coffers. Every time they got a question wrong, uh, they would see a red check on the screen, a red X on the screen, and they were barred from taking any money. What the researchers did, though, is they also placed a camera in the room with participants. Uh, and uh, they, they set this up so that there was a second experimental session. Uh, where participants had to come back in. And when participants came back in, the researchers accosted them with accusations. They said, we know you took money when you weren't supposed to take money. You stole from this experiment. You messed everything up and we want you to sign a confession. This is how social scientists can get at confessions in the lab in as high stakes a way as possible. Uh, but what they did is they told people, they had uh, two groups of participants, uh, one group that was told there was footage of them doing this and another group that literally got to watch the doctored footage, and I, I sort of didn't clarify this, but what the researchers had done in the interim is they had taken actual footage of the participant and spliced a, a red X onto a moment where there had been a green check, so it actually made it seem like participants had taken money they weren't supposed to take. This is something participants themselves knew not to have happened, but when accosted, well, they were either told there was this doctored footage, they were shown the doctored footage. Most participants, and this maybe highlights the low stakes of this, uh, did not, uh, were, were happy to sign the confession. Um, across conditions, participants signed this confession. But the really interesting thing here is the difference between participants in the do who actually saw the doctored footage versus were just told about it, is that at the end of the experiment, they were approached by someone who they thought was a peer, but was actually a confederate of the experimenter, trained to sort of get them to talk about what, what happened, what do you think was wrong, like what, what caused this? And participants who actually saw footage of themselves doing something they know they didn't do, were more likely to confabulate reasons for what must have happened, and actually come to internalize that they had done this bad thing that they didn't do. So such is the, is the degree to which they overweighted what they saw. They knew they didn't do this, but actually seeing the footage uh, sort of out there staring, staring them in the face, they were much more likely to come to believe that it was true. So this is the idea of sort of overweighting the information that we see. Conversely, we might miss information and we might therefore underweight what we can't see. Uh, and we might miss information for a number of different reasons. So maybe the camera angle doesn't capture something and so we don't see it because it's off of frame. Or maybe we are directing our attention to one side of the screen and so we miss what's going on on the other side. But sometimes we might even miss things that we directly look at. And this is something uh, that the re researchers in, in the sciences have called the in inattentional blindness. And I know uh, this is sort of a famous set of studies called the invisible gorilla studies that I know Judge Kennedy and Sandra talked about earlier this summer. 
Hopefully you have seen this video. If you haven't, I'm sort of ruining it for you right now, but I hope you go to YouTube and type in Invisible Gorilla and try to watch it for yourself. But the basic premise of this is that you're tasked with watching this ball playing scene play out and there's a team wearing black and a team wearing white and you have to count the number of passes of the players on the white team. So you're cognitively taxed with this idea. But what they they have researchers have done is they've made a guy in a gorilla suit, uh, this black gorilla suit right here, walk through the center of the screen, pause, beat his chest, and walk off. And what researchers have found across multiple iterations of these studies is that over half of people who are unfamiliar with this video before miss the gorilla. And furthermore, eye tracking research has found that they missed the gorilla even in spite of their sort of eyeballs literally being on the gorilla at the time. Which means that you might actually miss something that's right directly in your line of sight. You might quote unquote see it, but not consciously perceive that, that you did. And part of why I like to highlight this again, even though you, you may have heard of this example before, is this is a particular example that I think ties very nicely with a real legal case that inspired the sort of uh, collaborative and symbiotic relationship between researchers and legal professionals. And this is a case uh, of in Boston in the 90s where a police officer uh, was involved in a chase. Basically, uh, Boston police were pursuing four young black men who had fled a vehicle and taken off in different directions. All of the officers had gone in uh, on foot pursuit of these, off, uh, of these suspects. Officer Kenneth Conley was chasing one suspect in particular, uh, and he ran by a group of his fellow officers, beating a young black man who subsequently turned out to be an undercover police officer himself. And so in the case of assault against these officers, Conley was brought to testify because it was known that he had run directly past this, this incident. And they said, you must have seen it. Tell us what you saw. And Conley swore over and over that he didn't see what happened. Uh, and it was so unlikely to the court that that was possible that they accused him of perjury. They basically said, how is it possible that you would miss something that was right directly in front of your eyes? And this is part of what inspired the original research that led to, to the invisible gorilla studies and finding this idea that we might indeed miss something that is directly in front of our line of sight. Uh, and so this is part of why we're excited about a venue like this today that brings scientists and legal professionals together is to talk about uh, how to sort of marry these issues. So this is the idea that we might underweight information that we miss because we might not even miss, we might not see information directly in front of us. But I want to talk a little bit about underweighting in the context of information that's actually not even available. And I think this is really important in the context of discussions about body camera footage. Uh, so researchers have looked at body camera footage specifically, which is known to present a pretty skewed perspective of events, right? A body camera is mounted from the police officer's chest or glasses, usually, or shoulder. And so you often only get that perspective outward. And you very, very rarely get cues to what the officer is doing. You might get his hand swinging into frame. You might get his reflection in a car window. Uh, but what you can see here, and this is from the, the research that I'm citing, this is the same uh, a snippet from the same video. And at the same exact moment in time of an officer approaching a car, this is taken from his dashboard camera. So you can see the officer and the car. And this is taken just from his body camera, where you can only see from the officer's perspective him approaching the car. And what researchers did is they took many, many videos like this, both including police officers and other sort of non-legal contexts. And what they found is that what body cameras do is systematically lead to the under-representation of the intentionality and culpability of the camera wearer. So if you are watching a police body camera footage of him approaching this vehicle and then beating on the glass, you're much less likely to think he did it intentionally and to blame him as compared to if you see the full uh, um, sort of third person perspective. Part of why that is, is you're systematically unable to see him at all. There's no salient cues of the officer. Therefore, there's nothing to ascribe blame or agency to. Uh, and so this is sort of really important and I think a really nice, clear uh, demonstration of underweighting, right? The information that is missing can't be factored in as heavily into decision making. Part of why, just on a low, low, low level cognitive uh, perspective, that we might underweight information uh, and, and we might not is we might not realize that we're underweighting information. So this is sort of the last point I want to make about underweighting is that the process might actually even be facilitated by the fact that we don't realize we're missing information at all because we have structures uh, in our sort of cognition and perception that lead us to fill in the blanks of missing information. So this is a sort of a really low level example, but in one series of studies, researchers gave participants this image of, of essentially half a butterfly, a partially completed butterfly. 
And then they asked them to think about what it was that they had seen. So they had to remember, it was a recall task of what did you see? And they gave them this image as well as this image and another, a number of other options. And so basically, do you remember what you saw? And participants systematically were more likely to remember having seen the completed butterfly, even when they only had seen the partial image, which is a, a testament to how our brains are engaged in this sort of completion process. And this isn't just about sort of sad pencil images. This extends to real world scenes uh, where people might extend the boundaries of what they have seen. They might see an image of an alley and, and it ends at the trash cans, but might, they might, because of their experience and background, uh, impute an extension of that scene in their sort of mind's eye. So maybe we underweight the information that we miss because we don't actually realize we're missing information that much. And the last point I sort of wanted to make about these errors is overconfidence, right? We are overconfident about our interpretations of what we see. Uh, as Sandra said in the beginning, uh, we, prior our, we prioritize our visual senses. We have great amount of trust in our visual senses. And I think this is most easily seen in these sort of old series, these series of old classic experiments where researchers pit vision against your other senses directly where, uh, with contradictory information. So in one set of studies, they literally had participants hold an object in their hand, just like in this demonstration. They held an object in their hand and they had to look at it through a lens that they knew to distort the size of the image, right? You're looking at it through a lens, it's distorting, either making bigger or smaller, how much, how big the image seems, or the object seems, sorry, while your tactile sense is absolutely giving you an accurate uh, metric of the size of the object. And yet, despite that, despite in the face of this directly contradictory information, participants were much, much more likely to go with what their eyes were telling them, even though they knew what their eyes were telling them was wrong and what their hand was telling them was right. And people trust their eyes to such an extent uh, that even though they understand the possibility of bias or fallibility in our perceptual experience, it's not so for themselves. So in study, in one set of studies that uh, my colleague Kristen Jones and, and, and her colleagues did, uh, they asked participants questions like, if I'm paying very close attention to an event, I can prevent my worldview from affecting my understanding of the video. And participants were much, much more likely to agree that that was true uh, for themselves as compared to the average American. So over a series of questions about their own potential for biases and visual perception of evidence, people were like, okay, maybe bias is possible, but not me. I'm not biased. Other people might see images in a different way, but I'm seeing the right truthful thing. Uh, and the last point I want to make is that maybe part of what explains that overconfidence is that we don't actually, we, we systematically avoid new or conflicting information even when it's offered. So maybe you're sitting and watching this and you're thinking like, okay, maybe there's some biases in visual perception and people do have some things that might skew how they watch video evidence, but in the legal context, you watch a video multiple times usually. So you're not gonna have this one-off thing, you're gonna have another chance to watch it and bias will therefore be muted because of the second opportunity to take in new information. And that's what we thought, actually, my colleagues and I, what we did is we directly tested that question by having people watch a police civilian altercation. Then we also had another uh, of scene, but we had them watch a video. We, we used eye tracking to measure where they looked. We had them make legal judgments about it. And then we said, you know what? Usually you have to make these decisions after getting to watch a video multiple times. Let's have you watch it again. They watched the video again. We measured where they looked again, measured what they said a second time. And what I want to show you is a side-by-side -side example of sample eye tracking data from one participant in this study. So this is a little bit of a snippet. You can see this red dot represents participants' central focus of attention throughout the scene at time one and at or viewing one and viewing two. And what we seemed to find across participants is that people systematically demonstrate a very similar visual path uh, than they to the first time they watched it. Basically, people tread the same trajectory. Uh, rather than taking this opportunity to, to look at new stuff or the opposite stuff that they looked at the first time, they actually seem to follow their own footsteps and watch the same information again, engaging in what we called visual confirmation bias. They're, they're not taking the opportunity to take new information uh, and actively confirming the information they already know, which might be part of why they're so certain or confident about their initial interpretations. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Sandra. So how does overweighting, underweighting, and overconfidence play out in court? One example is this case that we're going to briefly talk about, McDowell versus Scherer, which relates to Scott versus Harris that we mentioned earlier. Now, the question in front of the court was whether McDowell's excessive force claim could be dismissed on summary judgment. 
And the case involved two videos, one from a police officer and another from an inmate who has managed to bring camera in the prison. So this is excessive use of force in prison. The trial and appellate courts had different interpretations of the video evidence. So you'll see here on the screen a quote from the district court that believed that it must apply the governing summary judgment standards, having witnessed with its own eyes the events at the core of this litigation. Now, the use of the phrase witness with its own eyes is significant. Video has the power to turn us into witnesses. It gives us the impression that we're transported directly to the scene of the events unfolding and may make us overconfident in our own interpretations of the video. The district court also said that the videos blatantly contradicted McDowell's account of the event in question. The third, court, uh, the third circuit court, however, had a different interpretation. Neither of the videos blatantly contradicts McDowell's account such that no reasonable juror could believe it, is what this court said. And this case is yet another great example of how the relationship between seeing is believing is a complex one and how courts may interpret video evidence differently even within the lifespan of the same case. And yet uh, uh, lawyers continue to tell jurors to believe their eyes. One interesting case to consider here is the trial of the police officer Derek Schumann for the murder of George Floyd. And you'll actually hear from somebody who worked on the visual display for this trial later on in this series on the session on November 18. But what I want to emphasize here is that even though the prosecutors repeatedly told jurors to believe their eyes, they relied on strategies then inadvertently acknowledge that seeing involves complex social and cognitive processes. For example, they showed multiple videos from different cameras, from different angles, and from different scenes, including various bystander videos, surveillance camera footage, dashboard footage, and police body camera videos. They even called on witnesses to testify about the footage, including here, you'll see an example from uh, two images that were shown and an expert witness, Dr. Tobin, who talked about the difference between lay and professional interpretation, saying that this may look insignificant to most people, but to an expert like me, this is significant. So in this case, we actually, the prosecutors had a complex understanding of the fact that not everybody who sees a video will interpret the video and they were visually and verbally reframing the video evidence even while telling the jurors to believe their eyes. But not every case will have multiple videos and with wide latitude, video can be used differently by different legal parties. Now the disparate assessment of video by court can also lead to inconsistent renderings of justice then may undermine the legal process. And that's certainly not something we want to do. Now, three key factors contribute to the inconsistent treatment of video evidence. The first one is the one you see on the screen, which has to do with the shifting and uncertain categories under which video is admitted as evidence. Now, the classification of video as evidence is important because it can shape both how judges decide on video's admissibility or how lawyers interact with the footage in court. With the introduction of photography in the 19th century, demonstrative evidence emerged as a category to govern the use of visual imagery as evidence. Under this view, an image cannot prove facts on its own. It can merely illustrate what witnesses say or be used to support other evidence. However, as legal scholar Jennifer Mnookin famously told us, Demonstrative evidence has always been an uncertain category oscillating between mere illustration and proof. It remains an ambiguous term with both courts and legal scholars disagreeing about its meaning. Video can be used as an illustrative aid, but its role as direct evidence capable of independently proving facts is also widespread. Furthermore, video has always been subject to the silence witness exception when recording events no one else was around to see. At the heart of the shifting and ambivalent categories under which video can be admitted as evidence is an uncertainty about how to evaluate video's probative value or the degree to which it can prove the facts it is offered to prove. Furthermore, 
video today is a technology that affords the simultaneous processing of sound image and metadata. And this is information about the digital file itself, like date, time, and GPS coordinates, among other factors. You'll hear more about this on the police body camera session that will close this series in December. But key here that I want to emphasize in the understanding that video can no longer be considered just analogous to sound and image, but potentially needs to be interrogated as a distinct form of evidence. Now, the second factor that contributes to the unregulated approach to video evidence has to do with a tendency to conflate what an image shows with how a viewer interprets it. In a nutshell, this is about the discrepancies in visual perception and interpretation that we discussed in our presentation. Judges, lawyers, and jurors, like people in general, are largely unaware of the various influences on how they construe what they see in images. The legal system unregulated approach to video evidence does risk uneven and even erroneous interpretations. And finally, visual literacy training is largely absent from law school curricula and professional training programs. Rapid scientific and technological advancements make it clear that the legal profession cannot remain focused only on words. Legal issues arising from the use of technology-based evidence like video have real human impacts. And visual literacy training in this context is important because it holds the potential to empower current and future legal professionals to be better informed decision makers. So these three factors show that video doesn't provide a simple path to the truth. A unified guidance for the evaluation of video as evidence is therefore important for the pursuit of equal and fair justice. But what would a unified guidance for video look like? One way to think about safeguards for visual interpretation is to use the rubric for eyewitness testimony as a model. Judge Kennedy and I discussed this proposition in our session in July, and Yael Granot and her colleagues have written on this idea as well. Decades of research into the variables that influence eyewitness memory has led to courts in 25 states as of today to incorporate some sorts of instructions and models for eyewitness testimony. There are some similarities and differences between eyewitness testimony and video evidence that are worth thinking about that make this rubric appealing and where we believe research in this area is headed. But we'd also like to hear from you and that's why we wanna use the time we, the remaining time we have for some comments, questions and feedback. You're welcome to ask us any questions to clarify any of what we've talked about but we'll also like to hear your thoughts about combining research with legal expertise to work on what guidelines for video evidence would look like and what questions we as researchers need to be particularly attentive to when, the, we, this, when we study this matter. So on that note, I thank you for listening, for coming to this session. And again, special thanks to SciTech, Lionel, Barbara, Laura, and Judge Kennedy for making this series possible. Um, all right, while people are formulating their questions, um, I'd like to get the ball rolling um, with a question for you both. Um, you both presented research from humanities and social sciences that clearly show that visual interpretation is subject to a host of influences and biases, but courts still tell jurors to believe their eyes, as you were saying, Sandra, um, which in some ways is playing up what uh, Professor Gonneau talks about in terms of this overconfidence of what we see. Um, so why do courts resort to this logic of naive realism? And also furthermore, I have a, a follow-up question as to if there are certain factors that make overconfidence more important, that is, are there further biases that are mediating this bias overconfidence? Uh, my mind first goes to education, um, but I'm curious about that. Do you want to do the first one and I'll do the second one? <laughs> oh, you want me to start? Um, I mean, just like in society, we tend to believe our sight, right? We tend to 
believe what we see, it's, it's, it's intuitive. And we're largely, as Al was saying, while we're aware that people can differ as to their interpretation, by and large, we believe that we ourselves are immune from that. And at some point in time, courts felt that eyewitness testimony was the gold standard of evidence. We talked briefly about this when we were preparing for this session. And now we understand there are all sorts of factors that influence eyewitness testimony. And I think that's why this kind of parallel uh, a evaluation of what are the challenges with video evidence and thinking through what kind of safeguards or potential guidelines would look like in this space. We're never going to mitigate all sorts of biases, right? But at least we can do a better job of, um, you know, minimizing some biases and maximizing the evidentiary potential of video. This is not to say that video shouldn't be part of the evidence. Video can produce evidence, but it's, you know, it's not uh, infallible. And the way we are uh, interpreting it plays a huge role there, and we need to be paying attention to that. And in answer to your the second question you asked, uh, Rory, I think in terms of what sort of further foments the overconfidence, uh, one thing that we sort of didn't talk about in the overweighting section, but uh, we have research that seems to suggest that when people sort of narrow their visual focus to, let's say, let's say you're watching a, a video of a police civilian interaction and you focus predominantly on the police officer, you could argue that, you know, you're missing half of the scene there, you're half of the critical information, especially if culpability is sort of a dyadic judgment in this context. And what we found is we, we, we did a research where we sort of measured where people looked, and then we also measured their sense of identification with police, and then how much they subsequently wanted to punish police officers. And what we found is it's not just that people who across the board are anti-police always punish the police officer and people who, you know, are more identified with police are always pro-police and, and very lenient in their decision making. It actually was a, a function of their visual processes, specifically the people who narrowed their focus the most, therefore missing key information, but sort of hyper-focusing on the officer, were more likely, it seemed, to fill in the blanks with their identity-based thinking. So it's only among the people who did this hyper-focusing that we started to see exaggerated influences of identity on decision-making and sort of a, a big split in how people punished as a function of sort of when you have this sort of narrowed scope, you have to bring other things to bear. So I think uh, there are just certain circumstances where uh, you have you don't realize that un like unconscious priors are influencing your decision uh, and that can lead you to confidence in certain situations. Um, there's a question from Etienne. Yes, hello. I don't know. I, it seems the camera doesn't work, but uh, that's okay. Uh, so yes, my name is Etienne Trepeny. I'm I'm I'm, I'm in Canada. I'm uh, so I'm uh, one of your northern neighbors. So I'm I'm a I'm a lawyer and filmmaker in residence at the University of Ottawa, where I teach a visual advo advocacy uh, class. So I'm very interested by everything you, uh, hello, I'm very interesting by everything that was discussed. And, and I have a question from your, your perspective. What, what I realize in, in the work I do here and, 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 and the research I do uh, is, is there's a misunderstanding in the legal community of what technology is, what it can do, how it can be used, how video is produced even, you know, like some basic stuff, you know, how Photoshop works or things like that. So, so from somebody like me, who has kind of grown up with these tools and used them as for film projects and now trying to bring them into my legal uh, sphere. Uh, this is what I'm trying to achieve. I, I just want to know if whether something you've noticed in your jurisdiction because in, in Canada, uh, we're not as far as you may be in the United States on these discussion, which is something I'm trying to change, basically. But I'd like to hear you on this, the, 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 the knowledge, the understanding of what can technology can do. You need to know what it does to be able to use it and to be able to decorticate like what you're being shown. So, uh, so yeah. So as a filmmaker, I... Uh, you know, as somebody who came here from the world of filmmaking and then ended up being a researcher and doing these questions, I fully agree with you, though, visual communication research, most notably, but by Paul Maceres, tells us that actually just because we understand how these things work doesn't make us more sophisticated viewers. And, uh, you know, that's also an interesting question. So he has a book from 94 called Visual Literacy, where he's saying is that understanding how these things work make us aesthetically potentially appreciate visual media more, make us 
potentially better consumers, better viewers of images, but it doesn't actually let go of these biases. And one example in advertising, why subliminal advertising works, because even when people know exactly how it works and they've done it, you know, sometimes in certain um, movies or in certain advertisements, they miss that. So knowing how film works, knowing the language of cinema, editing, et cetera, doesn't necessarily make us better interpreters of uh, visual media in a legal evidentiary sense. But at the same time, if for a lawyer to be able to think about how he's gonna introduce his evidence, if he doesn't know about those techniques, uh, oh, for you know, sure. You know, like yes. the lawyers like cannot use them basically and, and help their clients. So uh, no, no, no. So yes, that's the second part, I guess, of your question, which is yeah. why we believe visual legal literacy is an important yeah. thing because in law schools, students learn three years of how to work with text and dissect text at such a level of sophistication, but no effort is there for how to work with images with few exceptions. So uh, Penn Law School has a very well-known program in law and documentaries. Yeah, law school used to have a visual law project. So there are exceptions like that, but they're still by and large niche pursuits. And this is where we think is like at least some um, exposure and experience with visual materials matters. And actually as a short promo, uh, Christina Spiesel and Neil Feigenson have been doing this for 20 years at Quinnipiac Law School. And so they'll be leading a session on October 14 on these questions. Well, they're the one who directed me to your, your session here. And, and just uh, as a, a matter of, of interest for you, I'm leading a visual legal advocacy project called jurevision.ca. I'm putting the, the, the web there. Let's also at the University of Ottawa, and we're doing uh, we're doing just that, you know, so it's a, it's a great experience, more for knowledge mobilization at this point with law student for knowledge mobilization. But I want to explore more and more the uh, what you've been discussing here in the legal practice. So uh, so thank you for your for your insight. And uh, I'm looking forward to keep the discussion going. Um, thank you, Etienne. Um, we have a couple questions in the chat. The first from John Ferres is how important is the kind of job witness job witnesses have? Example is a supervisor at Walmart who often uses video to determine employee theft. Also, does use of demonstrative video in opening influences in the opening uh, influences how jurors will interpret other videos and photos? Um. I'd like to start by saying that uh, I respect all of the opinions that have been offered here. Uh, there's one uh, part of the uh, equation that needs to be explored, I think, more fully in, in your series. And that is, after 53 years of practice uh, in uh, both civil and criminal practice, um, I've had a lot of experience uh, in uh, uh, videos. Um, I remember one specifically. Um, a video involving uh, uh, a Walmart incident. And uh, the witness that was testifying about it was a Walmart employee who often used these, uh, these videos to uh, discipline or to discharge employees for uh, what they had done. Um, and in this case, it was um, this witness went on to testify that the video showed that the particular aisle where the fall had occurred uh, had just been videoed uh, 15 minutes before that, and there was nothing there on the floor. Therefore, they weren't responsible for the fact that there was oil. It leaked out of an oil can. And uh, um, I, in the trial preparation, I decided that uh, we were going to have to uh, debunk that uh, video because if we did not, the, the jury was going to conclude that they didn't have an opportunity. They had no notice and no opportunity to clean it. So I started off by saying and telling the jury, you are going to see a video that Walmart is going to present. And when you see it, they're going to say, well, this proves their case. Uh, I'm going to tell you that uh, the guy that's going to testify, because I've taken his sworn testimony, He's going to say that this absolutely depicts the thing, and he he uses this these type of videos to discharge employees and 
prove that people tried to steal from the store and so forth. So his, his use of these videos, he's very knowledgeable. He's the only one that knows at that point, we were not sophisticated enough in, in our technology to determine whether or not uh, this video had been clipped or not, whether the dates were accurate or not, because this is like 20 years ago. And uh, it, it turned out that that discussion with the jury and opening statements created, uh, 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 I think, a protection against the bias that they were going to have because this person is going to testify, look, we use this all the time uh, to discharge employees and catch people that are stealing. So I'm about to engage in a, in a, in a trial that is very important to me personally because there were no witnesses. And some of the photographs that were taken are being used by a trucking company to defend the case. And one of the photographs was a picture of my client's car door open. The question was, was my client off the travel surface of the road? He was a 19 year old, um, just fixing to uh, begin his basic training in the Air Force and was going to see his girlfriend. And he had a, a problem with his car. There were no witnesses, no reason. The reason we know he was having a problem with his car because there was a part of his uh, outside of his car that was dangling. And uh, that's the only reason he would have stopped. Otherwise the vehicle was fine. So they're saying their expert is going to say, well, he had to have walked around that door to get there. And as he walked around the, the truck sideswiped him. Um, of course, the, the evidence is going to show that um, that the officer opened the door to find this young man's cell phone so he could try to figure out who to notify of his death. Um, so what they're going to we're going to do is we're going to have to convince the jury at the onset that they're going to use that to try to base their whole case. So often. Uh, we do demonstrative evidence because sometimes you, it's a really fine line between evidence that a, a, an appellate court might reverse a case on because the demonstrative evidence uh, was just that and it wasn't uh, evidentiary. Um, and so we're going to do an, uh, a video that's going to depict our uh, version of what happened. And we're going to put that on in opening statement. Uh, and I think at that point, the courts often have to decide, are they going to let you do that or not? Um, and that's really important because I think if we're not allowed to do that, we're not allowed to expose some of the, the biases that you have set forth in, in your program here today that do exist. I was a psychology major and I understand that. And everybody, anybody says, oh, I'm not biased. Well, we know, first of all, they're not truthful. And, and or they are completely ignorant, uh, and either one of them is dangerous, you know, so. Um, John, just, not to uh, cut you off, just in the interest of time, I'd love for- Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Address this question, and then also there's a question about how the scholarship um, would be operationalized in terms of deep fakes as well, which I'd love to get to. Very important. I, I want to thank you so much for your question and, and the, the work that you're doing and and part of why we wanted to do a session like this is to hear from real practicing attorneys what they're actually dealing with with this because we don't get as much exposure to the actual day to day of what's happening in courtrooms right now. And I think you bring up a lot of interesting points, both with the Walmart example and the example you just brought up first. One is that, you know, you have this expert who is giving visual context to something that's missing outside the screen, right? So the employee knows Walmart really well, and they can speak to what's at the edges of the frame, which is really compelling. Uh, but I also think you brought up a really important point, which is you you talked about instruct giving instructions beforehand, proceeding, like you're about to see this. Let me preface what you're about to see with this sort of narrative overlay or instructions. And it turns out that that is incredibly effective because the only one of the best ways to to stop bias is to, to hit it before it happens right you can't have people unperceive something after they've already watched it anything about sort of visual cues after the fact are already too late so i think what you're suggesting about the potency of this opening opening framing or even to the new case that you're talking about which is an opening visual can be uh, incredibly powerful to sort of frame the way that people take in or or perceive the information I don't know if Sandra, you want to, yeah. 
Yeah, and, and so this is why, you know, Yael and I are interested in both uh, thinking through what kind of, um, uh, let's say, model jury instructions would be appropriate, if at all, uh, is bef uh, in a case with video, is it important to first bring in an expert who talks broadly about video, and would that do anything? Or Yael has even written about one potential that, that we need more research on. Um, because if you have a prosecutor or a defense counsel introducing a video, they're you know, shaping the narrative around that video in a particular way. So whoever gets to present the video first may have um, uh, uh, an edge over the narrative control of how the interpretation unfolds in court. But what if we would have, let's say a friend of the court person who introduces a video, this is a neutral party. So all they do is like, and now you're gonna see a video and that's all that the video has. And then you have prosecutor's defense on debating about the video, bringing in witnesses, et cetera. So the uh, presentation of video, who presents it and how it presents it is critically important. And when we're thinking through what would safeguards look like and what would guidelines look like, those are precisely some of the areas where we're trying to uh, test and propose a certain solution. So uh, thank you, Joan. This is just to say, hugely important area that you've identified. And that's what, uh, you know, Yal and I in our research lives are heading to uh, 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 next. Uh, briefly about, because, you know, we're close to time. One thing I'm gonna say about the deep fake session is that on December 2nd, there will be a, a whole session just on deep fake. So if you wanna tackle this more, I suggest you do that. I also have a piece coming out uh, in uh, SciTech Lawyer, which is the official publication of, um, uh, the uh, science and technology law section that talks about uh, both the kind of cultural, legal, and uh, technological consideration with deep fakes. By and large, with technology, so far we're good in um, detecting quote unquote real and fake. But just like we showed today, there is more to image than just whether it's you know real or fake. And it's that interpretive context that matters so, so much. Uh, and, and then this is, though it appears to be completely new, uh, deep fakes are an exacerbation and amplification of older problems. I mean, um, the famous case uh, uh, around demonstrative evidence coming out in 19th century is the one involving manipulation of the spirit photographs. So even within a legal context, the very um, uh, consideration about what constitutes visual evidence was already shaped by questions about visual manipulation, because I think that's what we care, not just in a legal context, but in society at large. And so is thinking more rigorously about images, about videos, one way in which culturally, at least, we're addressing the concerns with deep fake. So I invite you to join that session. Um, so with one minute left, um, is there any final comments maybe you have, Professor Grinnell? Well, I was just noticing this final chat from uh, the, from David about still images, and I uh, I think that's a really excellent point too. I think we've harped on video in large part because we want it, we we are trying to respond to what we think is sort of a, a, a slow evolution in the legal rules of evidence that in some ways treat video as just another demonstrative evidence, a piece of like like photographs, right? And so I think in some ways the legal system, uh, I, and, and this is me oversimplifying by not being a lawyer, and I apologize to all the lawyers and judges in the room, but uh, from, from the outside looking in, it seems like the legal system uh, seems to still sort of classify those pieces together. And we were trying to highlight uh, that there, that video might introduce unique and new forms of bias because it introduces dynamicness or d dynamism, complexity, ambiguity. But there are definitely absolutely still ways that these biases apply to still images, right? Uh, one of the things we know from psychology is the weapon focus effect and this idea that our eyes might be more drawn to a weapon in a scene. And we can see that even in an image of a man holding a knife versus a man holding a newspaper, uh, that, that our memory for his face is degraded in the context of seeing him hold a knife because we essentially were mostly focused on the weapon, whereas if he, we saw him hold in a still image a newspaper, we have a better memory for his face because our visual attention wasn't as captured by the object in his hand. So there's definitely things that, that play out in still images as well. Uh, it's just, uh, I think we, we're only now starting to see research on di more dynamic footage.
And I would just say we're filling in more in the blanks with a photograph because a photograph is a frozen moment, like a snapshot of something. So we're doing even more filling the blanks potentially when we have um, a photograph to deal with, which is just visual. It doesn't have the sound. It doesn't have the moving images. Uh, so th there are considerations there as well. And the last thing I just want to do is put uh, both of our emails in the chat, uh, because we know that this is such a time limited discussion and we we only do better research when talking to real practitioners and we want to keep the conversation going. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us and obviously come back to all these other sessions uh, that you can see advertised in the chat as well. But uh, if you have thoughts or ideas and didn't get a chance to share them, please, please be in touch. Um, thank you so much, Professor Grineau, and thank you, Professor Rostovska, and also um, thanks to the, to the audience and to the ABA Science and Technology Law Section for hosting this wonderful webinar today.